Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Hangout put on by the Digital Signage Federation. Today our topic is basic content do's and don'ts for digital signage. My name is Ryan Kohoy from Rise Vision, and I'll be the moderator for today's conversation. Uh, I also co-chair the Education Subcommittee for the DSF, and I put my email address on the screen. If anyone has any feedback about this Hangout, um, if you've got topics or ideas, or maybe you'd like to participate in a future panel, Feel free to email me. Would love to hear from you so that we can put together some meaningful topics uh, for, for everyone for educational purposes. Uh, we've got three great panelists that are joining us today, and I'll let each one of them introduce themselves in greater detail here in just a few moments. But joining us, we've got Dave Haynes from 169. Uh, if you don't follow his blog, highly encourage it. Great way to stay in touch with what's going on in the digital signage community. We also have Jim Nista from Insteo. Uh, Jim's been around digital signage for a number of years and very fluent in HTML5 and, and all the content topics we're going to talk about today. And last but not least, we have Rob Adams from Omnivex. Uh, Omnivex is one of the original pioneers in the digital signage software space, so he brings a, a lot of expertise from the software side of things as we jump into the conversation. Uh, we want to keep this an open, lively conversation, so we, we really encourage questions. Um, you should see a toolbar on the right side of your screen. At the bottom, there's a big green button that says Ask a New Question. Throw any thoughts, feedback, comments you have, anything you'd like us to expand upon right in there. If for whatever you don't see that little question box, look maybe towards the top, and there's probably nine dots for a little app navigator. And from there, you can click on it and um, uh, open that QA session. Um, we have received a, a great number of questions in advance, so we've got that seated to start our conversations for the panelists. But again, don't be shy as we get going through things. Um, we've broken the conversation down into four areas, so we, we kind of grouped a lot of the questions that are coming in. Uh, first is going to be layout design. Then we're going to talk about uses of content, talk a little bit about measurement, and then I lumped a lot of the other things together into what I'll call best practices. Uh, we are going to record the session, uh, and it should be posted up on the DSF website by the end of the day. So if you are, uh, you know, possibly miss it, maybe you want to share it with your other colleagues, check it out. Just go to digitalsignagefederation.com, go to the Hangout section, and if you arrow down, there's an archive there where this will be posted, as well as if you want to catch up on all the others we've done over the last couple of years. A, a lot of great sessions out there. Our next Hangout is going to be July 13th. Uh, our topic is how do I select a media player for my signage. So if you're looking for media players, whether it's a hardware question or an operating, ses operating system question, uh, you know, pencil in July 13th. Again, you can sign up for this right on the Digital Signage Federation website. Uh, and just one more point before we jump into the panel. Um, we are a non-for-profit community voice for digital signage. If you are a member, hey, thanks for joining us. If you're not a member, consider joining. Uh, you can check out more information at digitalsignagefederation.org slash join. Uh, when you do join, you get two DSCE certifications, you get discounts on events, um, you get uh, industry networking events. Uh, for example, in July, we're hosting a meet and greet up in Minneapolis. So uh, definitely check that out. So again, encourage questions. Please fire those in as, uh, as we get started here. And with that, I'm going to kick things over to the panel. All right, so I'll, I'll start with you, Dave. If you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself, your background with digital signage, and uh, how you fit into this conversation. Sure. Hi, everybody. I've I'm been involved in digital signage for about 17 years now, and in various capacities. Used to run uh, ops for a big company, done a bunch of things, but for the last many years, I've just been doing consulting. So I work with both end users and with uh, a lot of tech vendors, just providing advice, uh, help helping them kind of navigate their way through the ecosystem. Uh, I'm probably best known for a blog that I've been writing for more than 10 years now called 169. It's uh, 16 spelled out, dash 9 spelled out, dot net. There's almost 5,000 posts on there about digital signage. And just in the past uh, five weeks or so, I, I've launched a uh, podcast as well. It's also called 169. And that's uh, half-hour interviews with different people within the industry, and I've already had over 10,000 downloads off that podcast in that short time, so it seems to be resonating. That's fantastic. Well, same question over to you, Jim. Tell us a little about yourself, your background, and what you do at Insteo. 
Yeah, I'm at a digital signage agency, um, so to speak. We uh, do a lot of content creative work. Uh, I've been doing uh, creative work with um, websites for 20 years, uh, uh, marketing campaigns, those types of things. And about, um, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, we started converting over to just do digital signage only and um, do projects large and small. Great. And last but not least, Rob, tell us a little bit about yourself and Omnivex. Thanks, Ryan. I've uh, been in the, the digital science industry for a number of years. Previously worked for a company that ended up on Profit 100 fastest growing businesses and was responsible for building out their services arm and running the operations. I uh, was fortunate enough to, uh, two years ago, get the opportunity to join Omnivex, who have uh, been pioneers, as you said, in the industry. And uh, Omnivex is actually celebrating our 25th year in the uh, digital signage industry this year. So a, a real pioneer in the industry, starting with uh, doing uh, TSX and New York Stock Exchange uh, ticker boards, all the way up to present day, where we provide uh, complete solutions in the market. So really excited to be here today and join the great panelists we have. Excellent. OK, well, let's jump into it. Um, I'll start off with you, Dave. Uh, first question that came in was from Penny at Lockheed Martin. And the question is, how much content is too much content for one screen? Uh, well, from my point of view, anything more than one content element on a screen is too much. Uh, we're talking about audiences that tend to be on the go, they're moving, or uh, just generally these days, people have very short attention spans. So the more you throw on a screen at once, the more difficult uh, it's going to be for them to absorb all the different messages on there. And your money message, the one that you really want to get across, may be lost if they're busy looking at you know, a weather element, a news element, or something else. The only time I would say you'd add a second element would be for branding. But I would say even then, in most cases, people know where they are. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's that much value or importance in uh, adding even a watermark on there. I, I tend to strongly encourage people to think of this like outdoor advertising, like the billboards you see on the highway or uh, billboards, posters you see on bus shelters and things like that. They're very, the, the good ones are done with a very finite number of words. Uh, one visual element, uh, one call to action. is It's very, very tight, and I think the same thing applies in digital signage. Great. Uh, well, next question that came in, I'll send to you, Rob. This is from Ron at Fidelity Investments, and he wants to know what the acceptable number of items to put into rotation or loop would be. Any advice there? Well, it, it really is an important question. Is it also, is it an advertisement or is it information that's uh, being imparted for education? And, and as well, what's the audience that it's going to? So what's the age demographic? How are you communicating? Uh, what's the dwell time for the individual? So it really varies based on uh, how long the person's going to be sitting and watching. So for example, if you're in the doctor's office, Ryan, and you might be there for half an hour, I don't know about your doctor, but mine takes a long time to get to the appointments. And uh, so if you're looking for half an hour, a spot that runs and changes through two or three items uh, and is over in two minutes, I'm going to get sick of it within the half an hour. So obviously you want to add uh, a number of other items in. You want to have longer spots in it. Uh, alternatively, if you're a check-in and you're trying to seem to try to uh, do that impulse buy at checkout, um, the spot needs to be quick, and you probably don't want to go through too many. So you, you wouldn't want to have five or six. You want to have a few. I tend to agree with Dave. He made some really good comments on his last response. Minimalist, uh, it, it, minimalism is a, a secret. You want to have uh, fewer and more impactful ones. Um, but obviously, you want to determine who is the audience. As well, uh, millennials tend to be uh, very quick and uh, want quick responses. They multitask very well. Uh, so they, if that's your audience, you maybe want to move through things a little quicker. So you want to have uh, more, more uh, items on your rotation. If you're talking to seniors or other people who have a lot more concentration, especially if you're trying to educate them on something, you might want to have longer, longer uh, space here on your 
Okay, great. So next question that came in, I'll, I'll direct at you, Jim. Um, it came in from Rolito at HDI Admix and wants to know what's the most effective colors and fonts for digital signage? What's your thought there? Yeah, color, um, we get this question a lot. Uh, color, uh, I'll leave that one aside for a second. Um, what we're always looking for is legibility, and legibility at the distance that viewers are going to be uh, at average. So sometimes that is just kind of translates into a 10-foot rule, um, saying that uh, in most cases your average distance from a screen is going to be 10, 10 feet. So you want to pick um, uh, design elements for legibility. Um, and that extends more than just color and font. That extends into motion animation, um, uh, back to the number of zones, um, and, and all that applies. So, you know, uh, what, whenever I get asked, like, what's the best font or something, I'll say not Comic Sans, and then, and then you're, you're good from, from anything else other than that. Um, but, you know, there is no one magic trick for, for color. You don't want to, or fonts, you don't want to stick um, orange on top of red, right? You just want to go for legibility. So um, high contrast is great. Uh, depending on where your elements are, if you're in um, uh, any sort of uh, medical or hospital situation, you do need to kind of consider for, for colorblind situations, even color, and you also have to think about age demographics where um, uh, people who get older lose color perception. But all of that is just testing, um, and these are just kind of straightforward design elements. So uh, short answer, uh, don't use comic snaps for your font and your game. Great. Well, we did have a question that came in here, and I think I'll kind of direct it all three of you just to get your separate opinions on it. I'll start with you, Dave. Question is, you know, full screen video is great, but passerbys tend to lose context if they're not watching from the beginning. How do you maintain the context in the screen? Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the uh, the dwell time that people have in front of the screen and things like video analytics. Uh, and, and other types of uh, analytic tool sets that are out there will tell you people are around the screen for let's say four seconds or five seconds or whatever it is so uh, I would encourage the content to try to be timed to the amount of time people are in front of that screen on average so you don't want to be running a 30 second or a one minute spot in a high traffic area where people are just sipping on by uh, I, I, I've taken a look at a lot of video analytics results that have come out through the years and it, it's pretty rare to see any dwell time that's more than about six or seven seconds so I would say the, the content needs to be short tight and if there's a core message to have on there have it on the, that piece of creative the whole time or most of the time. Okay, Jim anything to add to that? Um, what I always talk about is uh, with this is is look at CNBC um, if you can re if you can visualize that in your head. I was actually going to try to bring up a screenshot here real quick, but uh, it's just too much content on on those types of screens. And in digital signage, we are often trying to do the same thing. Um, so when you have a video go full screen, um, and now you have still all of this content around the sides or whatever else. Um, you, you're losing it. So, you know, how do you solve this? Think about that uh, uh, um, that billboard concept. You have five seconds, regardless of what your dwell time is. If you could be sitting in a in uh, a waiting room and you still have five seconds to get their attention, and, and overloading them with everything is going to be less. It's going, to, I, in my opinion, just gets you less towards your goal of getting uh, people to perceive the content. So, um, don't overload and. Those videos uh, short, you three minute video on digital sign. You want to keep everything short, uh, simple, good motion, track the eye, and um, don't overwhelm. And and you'll get them to you'll get people to to watch longer as opposed to uh, clobbering them with everything and every font and every look and layout all at once. Great, Rob. Anything to add from your perspective from the software side? Well, I think uh, Dave and Jim have done a terrific job answering the question. Maybe just some guidelines. Uh, generally, if it's a billboard, it, it's got to be less than eight seconds because people are usually driving by. So you're somewhere into you know the five to eight seconds maximum. Uh, advertisers on on TV for many years have 
determined that you know anything from a 15 second to a minute ad is is, is the max. Obviously, on, on digital signage, it depends on the dwell time, the audience, uh, how far the people are from the screen, and what your goal is. Uh, where from 15 seconds to 30, pushing it to a minute is is quite a bit of time. And I agree with uh, Jim. You really need to keep it simple, really clean. Also, what is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to advertise, or are you trying to share valuable information and educate? So different. Uh, goals need to be determined. What is it that's your priority and what are you trying to uh, accomplish when you're doing it? The context is really, really important. If it's an attract screen on a video wall and you're just trying to draw people in for them to see it, uh, obviously you want to keep it simple, nice and crisp, uh, and, and pretty short. Great. Okay, I'll, I'll jump back to you, Dave. This question came in from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and I know this is broad, like we could probably have a whole hangout on this, but effective techniques for design for touch screens. So, any any advice? Uh, I, I was talking recently from uh, a guy who is kind of the lead product manager for ELO, which is one of the big touch screen manufacturers, and the whole... Uh, call to action that he sees all over the place, uh, touch here to begin, touch here to start, that sort of thing makes him crazy because uh, you're not really informing them as to why you would want to do that. So he says you, you've got to have messaging on the screen, first of all, that's going to draw people there and very overtly tell them the value of why they want to use this screen. So just something vague like touch here to start is not a great way to go. And then once you're once you're actually designing the touch experience, you've got to think about your audience and about the amount of time that they have. Uh, you don't want to be screwing around with a whole bunch of layers of different things. If uh, particularly if it's if it's something that demands a very speedy response, so like something like a check-in kiosk for an airline or something, that's three button pushes or you know a, a very tight amount of things that you do. Versus uh, something in a retail environment where you've got endless aisle, where you you, you should be thinking much more about a uh, tablet or smartphone-like experience with swipe gestures, pinch and zoom, all those sorts of things that people are accustomed to on their smartphones. So so it really uh, again to what Rob is saying and what Jim is saying is it depends on what the context of what you're doing is. Great. Okay, so next question came in from George at AI Squared, and he's curious about how are you making signage adaptable and accessible for people with disabilities, low vision, learning disabilities, or even examples of English as a second language. Uh, so, Rob, I'll throw that to you. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, a really, really important question, Brian, uh, with the, all, sort of the rise of knowledge around accessibility and certainly it's made it into government legislation both in the United States there's the American Disabilities Act and as well in uh, BC and Ontario uh, there are acts on uh, accessibility uh, around issues so it's really really important but also to uh, do a variety of other uh, industries and businesses so uh, some of the critical ones are obviously the, the font size and the contrast so that people with visual impairments are able to uh, see and, and participate. Uh, and, and things need to be considered. How high is the screen? How far is it from the viewer? All those kinds of things. And then as well, there's also the hearing impaired. And so uh, making sure that if there is sound with the signage, that uh, the sound is effective. Um, not just adding to noise pollution, but that people can actually hear it and has an impact. So you need to use it sparingly, but in the right application. So uh, I've seen applications where there's already a lot of background noise, providing sound on it creates problems. So, uh, so having directional sound sometimes will solve those problems, or having a kiosk in, in a better location will solve those issues. We've actually done some stuff. Uh, with Braille, a Braille pad actually driven by uh, the signage application in our software. And we do a lot of stuff around bus shelters, airports, and uh, transportation networks. And so uh, making sure that you have those features built into it is critical. Just to give you maybe one example, uh, we did an airport 
And one of the things we made sure we built into it, and it was required by the legislation, is uh, we, were, we put an icon on for wheelchairs. So people who are wanting to use the wayfinding to find their way around the airport obviously can't use escalators. They need an elevator. And they need to make sure there aren't any barriers in the way of them getting around the airport. So by pushing that icon on, on the touch screen, they were able to then go into a menu that's going to help them with their specific disability, find their way around the airport, and uh, having smart technology like our software, we were able to build that into the system. So really, really important considerations. And it's becoming more and more prevalent in our society. And obviously, making sure that you're compliant with local legislation is important. Great. OK, moving on here. Next question that came in, I'll send this one to you, Jim, is from Guy at Unified Brand Signs. Um, what's the difference between designing content for digital signage versus designing content for, say, a web or a PowerPoint presentation? Thoughts there? Yeah, um, a lot of that comes back to a very simple concept of uh, uh, distance from the screen. Um, and that's the most standard version of that answer. Uh, so if I just take, for example, um, HTML5 for digital signage versus HTML5 for, um, uh, for web, um, we're talking about 10 to 10 plus feet um, distance from the screen uh, versus um, uh, just a, a maybe 18 inches or something distance uh, from a laptop. And so those, um, those distinctions play in a lot in terms of a layout um, size and directing the eye. Um, the other thing about it is is that um, digital signage, especially with motion graphics, we're dealing with a, um, a directing the eye uh, concept that um, you don't have, especially with a PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint presentation um, directing the viewer to what you want them to see might just be walking them through the presentation uh, versus um, uh, digital signage being passive medium has to um, direct the eye uh, and, and not have too many elements of trying to compete for your attention at the same time. So um, it is a, uh, a factor we see too often is, is um, too much animation, too much motion, too many things happening in two different, too many different places at once. Um, and and we, we're always constantly trying to limit, pull back. Um, uh, yeah, you know, less is, is definitely more <laughs> with, with uh, digital signage content. Yeah, and uh, Dave, I, I'd just also say that uh, good good design, I think, is universal across these platforms. You, you know, great design tends to be minimalistic in just about every approach, whether it's print, whether it's PowerPoint slides or digital signage or outdoor billboards or anything else. Uh, it, the, as Jim says, less tends to be more. Okay, great. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's instead of talking about presentation and design, let's talk about uses of content. Uh, so, the first question there comes in from uh, Craig with the Dallas Cowboys, and I'll start with you, Jim. He wants to know what thoughts are about movement, video, and dynamic graphics. If you've got a design that's got more than one zone to the design. Yeah, um, so if you do have to do multiple zones, and actually the screen behind you is a good example of that, uh, Ryan, is that uh, you have one zone that's moving a lot more and another zone that's moving a lot less and just doing fades between. So you've decided, and, and, and when I work with my design staff um, and provide creative direction, I call that a, a concept of kind of preservation of motion. Um, your motion is moving in one area. Um, it's moving in the same direction. You don't have a lot of things kind of conflicting with one another. And with different zones, um, you don't necessarily, you can't really sync those up very well. <laughs> They're on different timelines and different playlists commonly. And so you can't, um, unless it's just one rendered video, it looks like it's multiple zones. If it's truly different multiple content zones, you don't have the option of, of generally syncing those up very well. And so my first response is, why do you need to do the multiple zones? <laughs> if we can talk you out of that, that would be better. But if you do, um, have one, uh, uh, have, have only one primary zone where you have a lot of motion, make sure that motion is, is preserving direction, speed, other things to it. And that doesn't mean it has to be boring. It just means that you can't have things um, flying in from one side of the screen on the left and the other side of the screen on the right. The viewer's just not going to know where their eyes are supposed to go. 
So um, uh, you can have dynamic, active motion, a lot of things happening at once. Um, uh, with uh, like we're seeing on your screen, Ryan is, is a great example of that. In another zone, it's just uh, having a subtle uh, dissolve or slideshow, and that is a, a great way of doing it. What doesn't work is when you have um, multiple areas, multiple continent zones moving in, at different speeds, or you just have a single zone and you have um, uh, motion that, that, that doesn't preserve direction, it doesn't have a sense of momentum, a sense of focus, and a sense of, of um, drive. Uh, like it, it's, it, I guess it, it's, a, it's a hard thing to get to, but um, where the animation makes sense for what it's doing. It's not just, uh, I've, uh, I've got uh, different effects, so I'm going to use all of them at once. Great. That makes sense. Okay, so next question is for you, Dave, and this may be a one-answer question, or one-word question, I should say. Um, so Keaton from Jarma Technologies wants to know, is scrolling content any good on digital signage? No. <laughs> uh, no, I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, there, there, there's been a movement in the digital signage uh, business for years now to kill tickers. Uh, they make no sense to me, uh, particularly when you have a, a, a transient audience. They don't tend to even absorb all the information that's on there. If you're going to do some sort of a news headline, uh, I would tend to want to do it full screen. There, there are a number of companies who do that now where they are taking news headlines and in the case of a company like ScreenFeed up in Minneapolis, they're retouching them and in, in a lot of cases rewriting uh, news headlines that they're getting from Associated Press or Reuters or whatever and packaging them up in such a way that it's very large fonts, it's full screen, it's presented well. Uh, tickers are an artifact of broadcasting from another area, era, and I really don't even understand, as Jim was saying with CNBC or Bloomberg or any of those guys, why they still do that except that at trading terminals there are guys staring at those screens all day long, But and you know all about trading rooms and everything, Ryan, from what the work for Rise Vision does. Maybe it makes sense in those environments, but not on a, a typical digital sign. Makes perfect sense. Okay, so next question I'll kick to you, Rob. Uh, it's from Glenn at Semper Energy. He wants to know about live data. What are some effective use cases that involve live industry data being fed into the signage, primarily for visualizing uh, employee communication, that type of thing? And how do you do it without creating information overload? Really good question, Brian. Maybe if I could just start by saying, traditionally, digital signage sort of first generation was a playlist and a bunch of stuff that was through, providing information to people and, and, and trying to communicate probably too much. And uh, it, it's pretty simple. It, it's not as dynamic. And we're, at Omnivex, we're one of the pioneers in uh, using live data. And so one of the things you want to make sure is that provider that uh, you're using can actually provide live data. It's not delayed or, or coming every 10 minutes or every half hour. It's actually live data. And if you have someone who can do that, then you can do a number of things. You can make the content dynamic and change ongoing. I like to call it the self-driving content. So that the content changes based on the data and the information that's being provided. And the advantage of that is it costs a lot less. You're not always having to refresh it. It's refreshing it as the data comes in. It changes the content. And the second thing is that it makes it more impactful because there's some actual context and relevance to the individual. Uh, so something's happening, it changes the content, and it impacts them based on that particular event. So just to give you a couple of examples, we do some stuff for uh, uh, Honda North America and as well Serif in manufacturing operations, where they have uh, just-in-time production lines, they can't afford any delays, and most of the employees may not have a personal device to be able to figure out uh, what's going on. They may not have a computer as well. So they need information on a screen uh, that provides them with information on any possible delays or any challenges coming down. Uh, managers need to know alerts uh, if there's something happening so that they can try and resolve it. So in those cases, real live data on supply issues or on machine breakdowns or other challenges that they might have can provide real benefits and real cost savings to those types of operations. 
Another example might be a hospital. We do Reed Hospital in the U.S. And they used it uh, throughout their campus of 40 buildings uh, to uh, provide information to their staff to make them more efficient in the delivery of the service and care that, that uh, they provide. Another example might be J.V. Uh, Irving, who are uh, on the east coast of Canada, and they have pulp and paper operations. And they wanted to make sure that the productivity uh, through a number of plant operations was uh, very effective. So they created some competition amongst them, just similar to a baseball standing or a hockey standing. And so each each of the uh, facilities, the pulp and paper facilities, actually the, the, their bonus based on the productivity of that particular plant. So they have live data based on the productivity and, and provides KPIs to both management as well as the employees to give them up to date on how they're doing compared to other plants in the operation. So uh, using live data can be very effective. Uh, another example which uh, can be really, really critical is emergency alerts. And I haven't seen as much of this application, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for it. If there's a lockdown or if there's some particular issue, there's a gas leak, let's say, at a plant or facility, being able to have that information and that data live, uh, notify employees so that they can safely get out of the building, whatever the issue is, is another example how live data can be very impactful on, uh, on uh, any organization. Great. Okay, next question I'll direct at you, Jim. Um, this is from George, and he wants to know what type of media is most engaging? That's uh, uh, an interesting uh, kind of generic question, but um, relevant content is the most engaging. Um, and uh, that can be video, that can be uh, uh, animation. Um, you're just looking for a sense of relevancy overall. Um, and uh, what do I mean by that? So you might have live data content, you might have uh, uh, video, but as long as it makes sense to the environment, it's going to be the most engaging. So um, we used to do a lot more social media content. Um, the idea being that people would uh, submit, con you know, tweets to the screen. They, they generally don't, um, despite what uh, what people think. Uh, and um, so that wasn't very engaging. It was just more of a one-sided conversation. So um, whenever we do user-submitted content, we um, we're doing a lot more of that very locally based, uh, not through social networks, but just having people submit content directly um, through a smartphone. Uh, through, a, through a web form, essentially. Um, and so uh, engaging is the best, um, timely is the best. Just a quick example of that, um, we just uh, did a video wall project with the dentist office, and part of that was to replace their, just gave a little web application to the receptionist. Um, they take pictures of uh, patients um, as they leave, smiling, and press submit. It's on the screen in 60 seconds. It's not going through any sort of social channel. There's no privacy concerns. It's only going to be within the office. Just digital, a digital version of that old Polaroid wall. That's engaging content because those people turn right around. They want to see themselves. They ask for a different picture to be taken if they want a better looking one. Uh, makes uh, patients happy. Makes them want to come back. Great example. Okay, uh, Dave, next question for you from Thomas at Mood. Who needs 4K content? Ooh, uh, who needs it? Well, I, I, I suppose people who have invested in 4K media players and 4K screens, but it, it's it's another one of those things where it, it depends on sight lines. If if you are going to be more than uh, 10, 12 feet away from the display, are you even going to notice the extra pixels of a, of a 4K display? Uh, it really depends. Right now, there's not. A lot of 4K content available. If you go to a trade show, and I go to a lot of them, you go on most of the booths, and it will be the same material from booth to booth to booth uh, of the the very limited numbers of stock video uh, libraries that have 4K content. Uh, Big Buck Bunny, which is this animated uh, open source uh, cartoon that a lot of people use, so. Yeah, it, it's going to come. 4K is part of the lexicon now at, at the consumer level. Uh, you, you have a lot of people buying 4K screens, but I, I don't know that it's terribly 
necessary for most digital signage networks yet and there are all kinds of operating implications uh, file transfer sizes storage uh, processing power all those other things that have to be factored in before you go to 4k so it's not just as simple as uh, we're going to get 4k screens because they're awesome Ryan if I could jump in here sure I think Dave's right on the money that uh, 4K, you need to really consider your options. Um, I think if you're doing something that's uh, marquee showcase video wall, uh, maybe 4K makes sense. But in most cases, the application at this point, uh, probably people can't tell the difference between good HD screens and, and, and 4K. And so, in, in my mind, do you need to spend the money on a Mercedes when really the VW is going to come from point A to point B? So, uh, you know, I know it's going to come and I know it's kind of uh, where things are headed, but at this point, I would consider very carefully whether you want to make that investment. And once again, I think it would be on a very marquee spot uh, to make it worthwhile and make it worth the extra money. I have a, a a quick direct example Go ahead. of where I've seen 4K work really, really well. And I think this is the only answer I would have right now. And that is uh, very close up digital posters, the kinds that you see in, um, in uh, gaming um, in hospitality. Um, very, very close up where you're going to be right in that uh, screen a um, couple, couple feet away. Um, that is very impactful, especially when those posters are um, um, acting like digital posters, you can get them to look like a light box. So what I mean by that is if it's just fading from a really high quality image to a second high quality image, um, and it's just a, a standard, more like a digital poster, you can get a, a true light box experience in, uh, in close-up viewing for retail, close-up viewing for uh, hospitality and gaming. Um, and uh, that's where I've seen it work best. And even professional uh, people in the industry are kind of getting into that monitor and saying, is this a light box or is this a screen? And uh, Because you just can't see the pixels. So that's an area where I think it's been really effectively used. Yeah, and I, I, I've seen in, uh, I was in Seoul, Korea, and walking down uh, a subway concourse, and there, there are seemingly a billion subway stations in Seoul. And they had posters for a fine Swiss watchmaker and I believe these digital posters were just using 1080p screens and they hadn't got the content right uh, so that you, you had a, a very expensive luxurious watch and you would look at look at that particular digital poster and the timepiece kind of looked like crap uh, the, with, with the multi thousand dollar uh, timepiece the, the high level of granularity that you could get out of a 4K poster, the people would want to look at it very closely and see every little uh, element, uh, or every little notch in the timepiece. That's where I think it could really work for, for high-end products like that or in, in things like seismic uh, displays for uh, an oil or uh, mineral exploration company where you have very high resolution maps or in medical imaging uh, where they want to show something to you know the, to, to the public or to donors or something else could work there but in a lot of cases it's it's I don't know that it's all that necessary okay well we had a question come in here from a viewer that wants to know how do you go about building a case to convert static print ads into experiential digital signage any of you guys have a thought on that or want to weigh in uh, just to um, segue from where we just were, um, you know, uh, again, and that's a, an area where 4K makes a lot of sense. I I, um, I got uh, kind of myself surprised last week. I was looking at a display in retail, and I thought um, I'm looking at. I thought I was looking at a light box, and I said, "Boy, that would be so much better if it was digital." And I looked back at about 20 seconds later, and the picture changed. Um, and so. Uh, and that's an area where it does make sense that um, you know you are just kind of using that as a digital poster. I'm I'm the last person to kind of be for slideshows, uh, digital signage or digital poster, or digital signage. But there is a case for it in many many cases. Um, so in ter terms of conversion from static into digital, prices are down, functionality is up, 
uh, whether you're um, an ad network or just a um, uh, an in-house uh, pointing sign, uh, you still have to think about timeline or inventory or, or the ability to convey more messages in one uh, space um, is just so uh, so impactful. So in terms of animating that or making it uh, have live data or whatever else, obviously that just increases the complexity but also increases a lot that you can do with it. So those become really, really easy um, to say we're going to move towards a templated-based ad as opposed to a static um, image-based ad so that we can uh, have uh, changeable messaging on that. Uh, so I think that there's so many different cases for this, but um, uh, even just into showing sports scores live on uh, digital billboards and things like that, just so, so, much, uh, so much opportunity to convert away from, uh, from print. Dave, Rob, any further thoughts or anything you've seen in terms of helping somebody build a case to make the jump from static to digital? Well, I, you can see it in the uh, digital at home advertising industry where they have been able to up their inventory uh, from one display, one you know, one poster face to six poster faces, billboard faces, that sort of thing, and then start to target uh, different content by different times of day and start to use live data to uh, respond to the, you know, the atmospheric conditions, weather, uh, traffic volume, everything else. So you can do so much more uh, once you've got this this display networked and responding to what's going on. Uh, you know, the question asked about experiential digital signage. I, I don't know that uh, there's there's necessarily a case to go from just a static printed poster to something all the way that's experiential. The you know, the, the first hop is to uh, just j just make it more efficient so you can do more with that one poster face by making it digital uh, as opposed to going all the way into something that needs to have a whole sort of experiential uh, you know, idea behind it. Okay. Um, well, we've got about, let's call it 10 minutes left, and we still have a lot of questions, so I'm going to kind of move through maybe a little bit quicker here. Let's call it rapid fire. Um, and let's, let's move a little bit into the measurement side of things. And I'll start with you, Rob. Uh, so from Craig at Dallas Cowboys, he wants to know with interactive content, um, any suggestions on how to make a call to action work when you've got multiple zones for an interactive display? Uh, I, I guess I'd agree with uh, Jim's earlier comments that really keeping it simple is the important thing. Uh, sometimes we get too much on it. We, we act with MLSC, uh, who, who is the uh, sports umbrella for uh, the Air Canada Center. They, they have sports franchises, Toronto Maple Leafs, the, uh, the Raptors, and then uh, the FC uh, soccer team as well. And they wanted to accomplish a number of things the facility. They wanted to have uh, entertainment uh, on their signage they, to, to create that atmosphere and that feel. And as well, they wanted to be able to, on uh, video walls, promote the restaurants and facilities that they have in their building. And then, as well, they wanted to be able to provide ad space for suppliers and others who might want to advertise as part of their advertising revenue on it. And so sometimes trying to accomplish all three of those goals can be uh, very challenging in trying to think through how you can do it with uh, maybe can be challenging if you have a call to action on the side of a video wall around, uh, you know, their their local restaurants in the facility, and a call to action in the center of it from people who are running ads. And so, one of the things I would try to do is really think through your strategy, and to try to keep it very simple, and to uh, try to make sure that you're not uh, having conflicts between the different calls to action that might. On, on the side, but uh, uh, really simple. I think that's the secret to it. Great. So next question comes from Brad at blinds.com, and he wants to know about measuring effectiveness of your content, qualitative or quantitative results. I'll throw that at you, Dave. Any thoughts on measuring effectiveness? Uh, well, it can be done in a number of ways. It it it. it it really traces back to what kinds what kind of data is available to you and uh, you know the, the best measures the ones that make CFOs happy are the ones that say this is leading to more sales or uh, more uh, signups to our loyalty program or whatever so as, as much as you can access 
uh, economic data that relates to the business and then map that to the data that you can hopefully extract from whatever content management system you're using to track against it and say when we ran this this happened uh, that that to me is is kind of a killer application within digital signage great um, so we've got a couple of questions here that have all come in about corporate communication so I'm going to kind of lump them all together and paraphrase them a little bit and I'll, I'll send this to you Jim but you know the gist of it is people want to know how do you best incorporate digital signage into a corporate environment, whether it's an office or a factory, and suggestions around content to make it effective and engaging? Yeah, um, we are doing a lot more of these types of things, and, and so uh, anywhere that you can um, not have to feed the beast of content uh, is going to be better. So anything that you can do with, with any sort of data feeds, um, any sort of KPI type data, um, or even as simple as kind of social content, but from, from an internal corporate perspective. So my concept of that is um, showing the photos from the um, company picnic, uh, those types of things. So uh, we're really looking at um, employee facing, uh, uh, moving away from the slideshow model of you're going to create content in PowerPoint, uh, export a bunch of JPEGs, and then upload them to a digital sign solution, and instead moving towards a much more data or um, external media driven approach. So you're not having to constantly create content, you're not having to, to feed that sign. Um, so, so things like a template that you preload employee birthdays into or that can read the, uh, the, the exchange of using exchange or whatever other directory that can read that directory because that's what HR people want to show. They want to, you know, happy anniversary to, uh, to Joe and uh, happy uh, they want to put that type of content on there, but they have to force them to create that, and then they just don't keep up with it. So that's kind of what we're looking at with that is, in addition to the standard kind of thing, we want to show Salesforce data or whatever else, read across to other types of information that just make it a fun sign. Replacing the, um, the, the printed out uh, break room signage and, 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 and the kind of newsletter and, and going towards a much more automated approach where they can uh, have always relevant content on that screen. And, and I would also pay attention to what uh, particularly the, the younger workers within the environment are using and how they communicate and maybe some of the tools that you're using. I was speaking with a company, uh, East Coast, just a startup, and what they're doing is querying, uh, they're using the API from uh, Slack, which is a uh, in-house communications tool that a lot of uh, uh, companies that are populated by millennials are using for uh, workforce collaboration and to uh, send messages out to the team saying Ryan did a great job on this or in the case of Ryan probably a crappy job on this but uh, uh, you know and the, 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 when somebody gives somebody else props they they tally those up and uh, if that person gets a lot of props the, the the message on the system shows up more often so those sorts of things where you have uh, within Salesforce or other tools, uh, communication that are going across the company. Uh, if you can start to tie into that, it, it, it can be really compelling. Yeah, we're doing things with Slack, um, Asana, um, on the uh, uh, on the support. You know, teams that have support um, desks, we're uh, we're pulling content out of those uh, platforms as well, and then also using uh, API uh, middle layers to help um, uh, move that content around a lot faster. So. Uh, anything that you can do that is just automated and coming from tools that people are already using, um, that's the way to go. Excellent. Okay, so um, I'll jump to the next question here from Deekran at Infinitus. Any suggestions on content for outdoor screens? I'll send that your way, Dave. Uh, same thing applies. Pay attention to how traditional outdoor has been doing outdoor advertising for decades now. And as you drive along, you will see really great executions of outdoor content, of outdoor creative, and you'll see really terrible ones where you, they've used fonts that are condensed and you can't read them. They, they're not using color contrast. I would say the one thing that you have to think of more um, than uh, you, you, you do with uh, indoor sorts of billboard kinds of advertising is the impact of sunlight and glare and what colors are going to cut through that so it's a best practice no matter what you're doing in digital signage to test 
uh, the content that you're creating on the actual screen and conditions that you're going to use it in, in terms of sight lines, brightness, everything else. Great. So I'll, I'll throw a little bit of a hardware question at you, Rob, that came in about player location. Um, they want to know, should you locate the players behind the screens, or is it better to remote them somewhere and send it across video extenders? Thoughts? Um, really good question, Ryan. And it can, uh, the answer can be yes to both. Uh, it really depends on the number of things. So you have to consider the context. So is the application in an area where there might be manufacturing, there might be a lot of dust, um, there, there might be challenges if you have uh, fanned uh, media players. And so, so what's the environment? The environment's really, really critical to those types of decisions. Obviously, if you have uh, a lot of dust, it's in a factory or a manufacturing plant, uh, somewhere where it's going to be a challenge, you want to try and make sure that the players are located in a central location that's away from that, uh, you know, uh, an audiovisual box or whatever uh, sort of arrangement they have. Um, obviously, that'll add to the cost because you've got to do some cabling to get it there. On the other side, if you don't have those environmental constraints, uh, putting the screens, uh, the players immediately behind the screens makes it a lot easier. Of course, a lot of change is taking place. The players are getting smaller and smaller as you have Android and other players. And now manufacturers actually have a system on a chip and WebOS applications so that you don't even need a player is actually built on the screen. So that takes away some of the challenges. So once again, it depends on the context, the environment you're in. Uh, there are a lot of pros and cons, but whoever is doing your installation for you should talk through those kinds of challenges to come up with the right decision for you. Great. So I'll throw one last question here, and I'll, I'll throw it to you, Jim, and then we'll let each of our panelists kind of give us their closing thoughts as we, we wrap things up. So last question, Jim, came from Art at Dreamlight Pictures. And he wants to know about audio. He said, you know, they've been doing digital signage for eight years and they have a lot of installs, but recently people have been asking more about audio. What's your opinion of audio and how does it fit in? Is it a trend or are things changing? Any best practices? Uh, we rarely get a request outside of, you know, a video loop that, that, that uses audio. Um, and so if it's an experiential project that uses uh, audio, um, it it's uh, it's going to be there, but in retail and hospitality and other environments like that, audio on the digital sign is actually a bad thing um, because there's uh, pre-programmed content, um, you know, coming from let's say like a, um, a mood or um, uh, you know play network or, or one of those groups is actually providing um, a, a digital audio stream for the location um, to kind of set the tone. So it's very very rare outside of you know, sometimes in corporate communications, they'll have a video that has the CEO talking or whatever else. But it's very rare that we get requests for it. And um, you know, it, it's um, it, I don't know that it enhances digital signage in, in most cases. Um, that's uh, that's at least what we've seen. In in, the, in most cases, I'm talking like you know, in 80% of the cases, uh, the silent screens have a tendency to, to just be the the norm, and uh, there's really no no reason for anything else. Okay. Having so, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to jump in. Having a little bit of experience in where sound is used, uh, it can create problems in, in cases where there's already a lot of background noise. Uh, it can just add to the noise pollution and really create a problem. Uh, as well, it can sometimes be a challenge if there are employees who uh, are continuously listening to the loop. We've actually seen where. Uh, the employees got so frustrated with the same loop playing over and over, they shut off the whole screen and, and the whole experience went away. So you need to consider the challenges. Uh, I've seen some really nice applications, you know, DMs, and uh, some facilities like that where they use directional sound that works very effectively uh, to talk about a particular display. So there are some applications that will work, but uh, like Jim said, you need to be careful what's the impact, what's the environment which you're trying to uh, do the sound application. Great. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to kind of move to quick closing here. Uh, I'll start with you, Dave. 
Any closing thoughts, any takeaways for our audience today? Like, you know, just one or two sound bites that if they're working on their content, what should they, uh, what should they remember most? Uh, think about your audience. Uh, r really understand why would they be looking at the screen? What do they want to know at that moment? Uh, where are they? What are the dynamics around them? There's a good friend of mine who runs a company that was acquired about a year and a half ago by another larger company, a guy, Denis Levine, who runs Arsenal Media. And he said something one day that's always stuck in my head. He said, you have to earn your viewers. And that, that really resonates for me. You don't just automatically get viewers because you put a screen there and you're running some content. You have to earn their eyeballs. That's a great point. Jim, closing thoughts from you. Any takeaways? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's um, a lot of challenges when you're dealing with content in, uh, in, in creative. And uh, one uh, big challenge that we see in digital signage is we're not a, typically approaching it as a creative solution, especially in smaller and medium-sized businesses. We're, we're approaching this as a technical challenge as opposed to a, uh, a, a, a visual communications challenge. I'm, I'm commonly talking to people about the fact that this is a visual communication industry. There's no reason that we would exist without the, re the need to put creative and graphics on a screen. And um, it can't be an afterthought. It must be the first thing that we do. Great. And last but not least, Rob, bring us home. Thanks, Ryan. Um, once again, visual communications is, is the secret, as Jim said. And, and one interesting stat that I, uh, I'd like to uh, just raise is that 90% of our brain's activity in digesting things is actually visual. And we process things visually 60,000 times faster than, than other forms. So it's really the visual that's important. A couple of keys that I've learned over the years. Number one, what's the problem you're solving? Or what's the thing you're hoping to accomplish? If you just build a digital signage uh, experience and you don't think about what it is you're hoping to accomplish, or whatever it is, you're not solving the problem, you're not going to get the root of it. Secondly, you have to have a really good content that is geared around the viewers. As Dave mentioned, the viewers are really, really critical. And then you need to have software that can be dynamic and deal with the data. I know Dave's actually doing a webinar drilling a little deeper into data uh, next Tuesday uh, with Jeff Collard, their president. And as well, um, making sure that you have a platform that goes across the organization. Because your applications uh, may be more than just wayfinding. You may uh, need to do things across the organization. So trying to make sure that you have a content platform that can do that. And finally, uh, as Jim said, the, the creative content is the magic piece that makes it all happen because it's all visual and so I agree with both uh, Dave and Jim that it's so important to this. Great. Well, with that, I'll bring things to a close. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, uh, you know, check out the website at digitalsignagefederation.com. If you missed part of the conversation today, uh, the recorded version will be up later on today, early tomorrow. It'll be out on the website. Just check out the Hangouts page. Uh, also, just a reminder, in July on the 13th, we'll be doing the session on selecting media players, operating systems. So if you're interested in that topic, feel free to sign up for that webinar. Uh, and again, we, we'd encourage you to just learn more about the Digital Signage Federation. And if you're not a member, consider joining. Uh, we will send out an email to everyone that registered uh, to attend this, uh, this Hangout with the recording of it. And you'll get a coupon for a discount for your first year of membership if you'd like to consider that. So watch your email box for that uh, in the coming day here. So, so with that, I want to thank uh, Dave, Jim, Rob. Thanks for all your insights, uh, you know, sharing your time and, and your talents here today. We really appreciate it. And for our attendees, thanks for, uh, for attending. And happy creating. <laughs>